Hold up, church. Are you ready for the Word of God? I'm excited to bring my first message for 2020 on a Sunday service to you today. And I hope that you're ready to hear the Word, engage with the Word, be inspired and stretched in faith. I got a question for you. Imagine you received an email in your inbox and it said, Hi, I'm David Rich and I am... I'm, I'm, I've got a proposition for you, a business proposition for you. You see, a client of mine deposited 22 million pounds into her account before she passed away in an automobile accident on the Autobahn in September 2020. And because you have the same surname as she did, we propose that you take a 50% cut of that commission, of, of that amount, of that value, and we'll take the other 50%. You just got to reply to this email with your name, address, bank details. You got to deposit a little bit of money. Well, I, I wonder what you would do if you've received an email like that. Uh, hang on a minute. I'm sure you have received an email just like that. And I'm pretty sure you did exactly the same thing that I did. And I continue to do every time that an email like that comes into my inbox. You, you reach out, stretch out, and you push the delete button. You don't even finish reading the email, right? You delete it because you know straight away instinctively that this is a hoax, it's a scam, it's phony, it's false, it's fake. And you know that if you head down the wrong path, you're not going to end up getting that 22 million or half of that share of 22 million. You're going to end up in all kinds of problems. And maybe some of you have replied to that email and now you're on the other side of losing your identity, scams, uh, perhaps your bank account's a little poorer than what you thought it ought to be uh, because you made some choices and some decisions around that email. But I really want to just kind of precursor today's message with this because it's amazing out there in this world how many promises get poured out and how many offers and opportunities get put out that are just not, uh, they're not, they don't live up to their expectations. They don't fulfill what they promise. And so we as customers, consumers, as, as humans, we are very easily uh, shifted into a wary kind of skeptical mentality and perspective toward what others say. You know, there are plenty of false advertising schemes out there and they promise something, but they don't deliver. And there's people who make vows and promises with each other, partners, spouses that promise and don't deliver. There are uh, all kinds of words that we speak it's like well i'll do that let me do that we forget we don't do it we don't follow through i'll pray for you we never do you know there's promises that humans make that we just don't deliver and we don't stand up to it and so over time it is easy for the human frame for the human mentality for our minds and hearts to kind of get a little bit wary and skeptical our promises really real do they really work is there anyone who is actually faithful to hold consistent to their word. Well, today I want to encourage you, church, that there is someone, and His name is Jesus Christ. He promises and He never fails on His promise. Our Father in heaven holds true to His word. The scripture says this in, um, in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, If we are unfaithful, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny who He is. You see, just because we may never have seen or never come across or never had a relationship with someone who is actually faithful to fulfill their words does not mean that our God does not and is not able to fulfill His promises. And I want to encourage you in this new year to get to know your God, to draw near to Him, to experience His presence, to love His Word because it will change you from the inside out. He has made lots of promises with you and I. And the good news is God is a promise keeper. He's the one who makes a way and He never fails. They may not be fulfilled in our timing or in our way or according to our concept or even according to our, our, our human desires. But God knows how to do it even better and bigger, even greater than anything we could ever imagine. He is a good, good God. And, and somebody has to say with me in Jesus' name, Amen. Hallelujah. There is a reason why God spoke to His servant Joshua. And He said this in Joshua 1 verse 8, Study this book. What book? The book, the Word of God, the Bible, the, the Scriptures, the truth, the Word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. 
Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. There is a very simple, clear reason why God spoke to Joshua and said, Hey, you got to make sure you get this word living on the inside of you. Here it is, church. It's so that Joshua would know clearly what he needed to do, what he needed to believe in, what God had actually promised toward him, what he had to emphasize in his life, in his daily disciplines and routines, give his energy and his heart toward. Because if you don't have that guidance, if you don't have that direction, it's impossible for us to really know the true paths that will lead us to the favor and the grace of our Almighty God. Not only did he say that, he said, don't deviate from the paths. In verse 7, he says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then, everybody say then, say it out loud. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Anyone out there today want to be successful in everything, perpetually successful, never failing, never dropping, never never missing the mark? perpetually consistently continually successful that's me i got my hand raised i hope you do too throw something down there in the chat room i tell you that the god that we serve is able to make our life that successful but here's the deal we need to learn how not to deviate how to stay on his path remain in his ways all the days of our life hallelujah glory to god these are the kind of promises that never fail i mean our god just makes a way because that is his nature It is who he is. So what did God actually promise Joshua? When Joshua studied these scriptures and learned and grew and heard the voice of the living God, what did he hear? This is the word that's written in Joshua 1 verse 3. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set foot, uh, oh, sorry, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon wilderness in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. I mean, this is as far as the eye can see, east, west, north, and south, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you for as long as you live, for I will be with you. Hallelujah. As I was with Moses, I will not fail or abandon you. I want you to see this picture, church, just for a minute. This was a promise spoken to a guy who had been in the wilderness for 40 years, wandering around the desert places. He knew no no other, other life other than the wilderness and Egypt. He was 19 years of age when the exodus took place. And so at 59 years of age, he hears this promise from God. He's known no greatness in his life. Uh, in terms of the land which he's lived in. And now God is opening up a window and a door. I am sure his heart exploded on the inside of him. His spirit came to life like yours and mine does when we hear the promise of God, which is for us and not against us and leading us into green pastures and along the pure and perfect paths of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, God was literally opening up something fresh and new for the latter part of his life and this is glorious 40 years earlier joshua had gone into the promised land and had scouted out seen the land and for sure for four decades the pictures the memories the thoughts of the promised land had been rolling around in his dreams in his daily meditations he was expectant for this moment and he knew that the good lands flowing with milk and honey which he'd seen 40 years ago were about to become his just like the goodness of god i declare it over your life today are about to become yours when you learn how to take the land that god has possessed uh, has uh, has promised to you when you learn how to possess that you see god has made some amazing promises toward you and i some amazing promises but they're all activated with one special key believe obey and act go and get out there and trust god's word believe in his word go and obey the word of god don't deviate to the left or the right and act upon it you can't just think these things we got to learn how to do what god called us to do for joshua the key was one step in go and step in joshua 1 3 i promise you what i promised moses what wherever you set foot you will be on land I've given you. In other words, go in, step in, and possess. And wherever you stand, wherever you put your feet, 
that is land that belongs to you because I've made a way for you, God says. I tell you, some of us, the problem is not the lack of the promise. The problem is the lack of the progress. It's the lack of stepping in and moving and making some actions toward the things of the Word of God. Instead of progressing and moving forward, we kind of gotten stuck. And we go round and round the same old excuses, round and round the same old reasons why we can or can't, the same old thoughts, the same old lack of intent and purpose and mission. We're just going through the motions, going around it again. Do you know your 2021 can look exactly the same as your 20, 2020? It can look exactly the same as your 2019. You could go year after year after year. You could even go decade after decade after decade and never change or grow or progress because you haven't made some choices, some determinations to conquer the land on the other side of the Jordan River. Did you ever wonder why Moses did a lot of walking and why Joshua did a lot of walking and moving and progressing and fighting and overcoming? It's because God promised that when they kept moving forward, that they would possess more and break through more. Isn't that the same for you and I? If we sit back and we just relax into our comfort zones and where we used to, we never move forward into the things of God. We never break through or conquer or possess what's ahead for us. We can easily fight one battle and stop, but we only possess that little bit, miss out on all the rest. We've got to keep moving forward, church. Don't get tired or weary or lazy. I know it's been hard, some of the seasons that some of us have been going through. But that's no excuse because we serve a mighty God whose mighty rushing wind is behind us. The Holy Spirit anointing, the power, the glory that God is moving us into in 2021 is breathing new life pushing us into a, a new journey and onto new, uh, new territories. We are going to possess the things this year that we weren't able to last year because the time wasn't right, the season wasn't there, but God is moving in our midst in Jesus' name. So every time we enter into new territory, something new, we face new struggles, new obstacles, new challenges. But please don't ever let that stop you from moving forward. Hallelujah. The joy is the conquering. Keep breaking through. Oh, sure, it can, feel, uh, it can feel overwhelming at times, stepping into this new journey of faith and walking forward, you know, taking on a new job or buying a home for the first time, starting a business, tithing for the very first time. It can seem hard. I get it. But you know what? Destiny, destiny defining requires bold and decisive decisions and actions towards the promises of God. So make those decisions. I don't want this year ahead of me to look like last year. I don't want it to look like the year before. I want to step into the fresh, brand new breakthroughs, the mercies of God, which are new every morning. I'm about to, and I want you to come on this journey and adventure with me because the year ahead is going to be exciting and somebody's got to say, Amen. Hallelujah. I often use these words, adventure and, and journey, to describe the Christian life. If you've been around this church, you heard it a lot of times. Because my experience is that when we walk with God, hand in hand with God, that He takes us on the greatest action, adventure, and journey that a movie could never portray. Life is so much better than the movies. It's the real deal. It is heading into the territories, the promised land, the breakthroughs, the grace, the overcoming, the miracles that only God Himself can unlock over our life and in our destiny. Amen. And so we've heard the promise. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I'll tell you what Joshua did when he heard his promise. I got four keys for you, church. Write them down. Think about them. Let's apply them. Four keys that we need to apply as we hear the promise of God to step into the destiny that God has for us. And I'm believing you're going to be really, really encouraged in Jesus' name. Here's the first one. Four keys to possessing the promises of God. Number one, see for yourself what God has promised. Scout out the land through eyes of faith. Don't just take my word for it. Go and see it for yourself. Go and possess the promised land God has for you. Joshua 2 verse 1 says, Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove, he instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. The first thing Joshua did when he heard the promise of God 
was he opened up his eyes and he fixed them on what was ahead. He fixed his heart, his mind, his attention on the things on the other side of the Jordan River. God said, every piece of land you stand on, you can have. Joshua said, all right, come on, let's go. Let's make it happen. You know, too many of us, church, we spend our whole life thinking about and focusing on the stuff that's happening right here, right now, in our midst. We're focused on today's news. What were the sports scores overnight? How many shifts did I get in this week's work roster? I believe that it's healthy for Christians to spend their energy, not all their energy, I mean most of it, thinking kind of ahead and going, hey, what's coming? What, what can I do today to prepare for tomorrow? I got to start thinking in, in God's terms, according to God's paths and God's ways. Start thinking eternally. Start thinking uh, in terms of the kingdom of God and, ex- and the way that God is moving and thinking and where He's leading me instead of being stuck in the now right here. You see, promised landers don't think or behave like wilderness wanderers. It is so important, church, to get our minds thinking about the promises and looking ahead and looking forward instead of being stuck in our past. Yeah, I get it. Looking ahead can be scary sometimes. You know, Jericho had big walls, fortified walls. You start seeing what's ahead and you start realizing, oh my gosh, the things I've got to learn, the things I've got to stretch through, the things I'm going to have to overcome, the weaknesses I'm going to have to let go of. It can be scary at times. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Don't be the one who sees and faints when you look into your future. Instead, dream big because you serve a big God. God can make it happen with you, hand in hand. Yeah, you're going to start seeing the the impossibilities, there's going to be questions that get raised, big questions like how or but or what if this happens or I can't see the way. Inevitably, there will be obstacles between the promise and the provision or the breakthrough because if there weren't obstacles there, you'd already be in the provision. You'd already have made the way. It's the ones who can navigate the problem the best with their God that make their way into the provision and that experience the promise of God instead of just hearing about the promise of God. I like to say it like this. Promise, you say it out loud with me. Come on. Promise, problem, provision. What does that mean? God makes a promise, makes a declaration, and if we can overcome and make our way all the way to the end, we will experience the provision, but somewhere in the middle there's going to be a problem. And I don't know what that problem looks like in any given scenario or circumstance. It looks different all the time. But we need to learn as children of God that we serve an amazing big God who can take us through all the problems and help us to break through and overcome. And somebody's got to say hallelujah to that. Scouting ahead in our life and looking out and seeing the promise and the future of what God is leading us into often reveals both the problem and the provision. It's like... If you can overcome this, this is what you'll have. If you don't overcome, well, you, you know, well, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, you've got to walk with God, right? You've got to hand in hand with Him. You've got to make a way. The problem becomes elevated, but the provision also becomes elevated. And it's a, it's a choice that every one of us as a believer makes. Which one will we elevate? Which one will we focus on? You see, believers do not scout ahead to get swamped in fear Instead, believers scout ahead so that they can know what they need to raise their faith, to trust and believe God for. You're not there yet, but you can be there if you raise your faith for it and you increase your trust and your belief in your almighty God. Hallelujah. This church hasn't bought its final property yet. There are days and seasons coming ahead. It's going to be bigger, better, greater than ever. This church hasn't reached the difficult people groups that we're called to reach yet. This church hasn't established its greatest, most anointed ministries yet. Grace and I and the worship team haven't written the best songs yet. The dance team, creative team, haven't written the best dramas or choreographed the best dances yet. And I thank God, hallelujah, and I praise Him that I haven't preached my best messages yet. You see, the best is ahead. We can truly say it with all our heart. The best is yet to come. But we're only going to get there, church, when we take the promise and we see the provision at the end and we, we navigate with our God through the problem. So don't let anything scare you. 
when you look ahead and when you start scouting toward what's, a, what's ahead, God will take you on that journey if you'll just walk with Him. Christians do not bury their heads in the sand. They see and they dream with the eyes of their Father. There's this scripture in Deuteronomy, and I was reading it in my Bible. It's got a title in my, my version uh, above it, and it says this, Laws Concerning Warfare. If you want to do good warfare, here's how to do it, church. Deuteronomy 20 verse 1. When you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own. Anybody feel like they're in that kind of battle today? Do not be afraid. The Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. Hallelujah. When you prepare for battle, the priest must come forward to speak to the troops. Hey, your pastor is speaking to you today. And he's speaking with an anointing and an authority that I tell you, the Word of God, the Spirit of God is delivering into your life a new faith, a new expectation, a new trust for what's ahead. He goes on like this. He will say to them, listen to me, all you men of Israel. Do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies and He will give you victory. In other words, let those words of faith rise up on the inside of you. A whole new expectation for what's ahead. There's good things for your 2021 church. So get ready. Scout ahead. If God says it can be done, it can. There's nothing impossible with your God. You see, the whole idea of scouting ahead is not to be scared or or afraid about the future. It's to be reassured of the victory. When those scouts went out, Joshua sent them out. They came back to Joshua and they'd seen the big walls of Jericho. But you know what they said? This is what they said. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said. Joshua 2, 24. For all the people in the land are terrified of us. They saw something greater in that day. That was what stood out to them. You gotta be assured when you see the land, God's given it to you. He's made a way. For 40 years, these people had been spooked about the Israelites because they'd heard about the way that God had parted the Red Sea for them to walk across, the way they'd beaten Sihon and Og and all the other kings. God had done good things. I tell you, don't be crippled. Don't be crippled, church. Step out, stretch in, scout out the land and see it through eyes of faith. Here's the second thing. Get yourself onto holy ground. Get yourself onto holy ground. There's this moment as Joshua is approaching Jericho and there's a couple of verses that kind of just stick out there. It's like they're there, but they don't make a lot of sense in the context of the whole story. There's no resolution given to it or why, or it's just there. I want to read them for you because it's, it's amazing what this actually means for us. Verse 13, Joshua 5. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you a friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. He either met an angel or met Jesus or something something supernatural happened there. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. And that's that. It literally ends there. It doesn't go on further than that. No no explanation given for why it's there. The very next verse, he's standing there at at Jericho, fighting a battle. It's kind of just three verses sitting there. It leaves us completely hanging. But what does it mean? Church, I tell you what it means. There was no way God was going to allow Joshua to, to go into battle against Jericho without first standing on holy ground, without first getting into the presence of the Savior and the Almighty God, without standing there in the habitation under the shadow of the wings, in the tower and the refuge of His Lord and God. It's so important, church, that we keep drawing near and entering into the heart, the connection with our, with our Lord and Savior, with the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. The, the anointing of God that we find in worship and when we lift up His name and meditate on His words and hang out with Him is so exceeding beyond our expectation. It's beyond our understanding. I don't know 
or understand why it is, but hanging out with God just opens up new levels of blessing. It unlocks new freedoms, new breakthroughs, new power, and new glory. When God's children try to fight battles without first getting themselves onto holy ground, they're only going to be fighting in their own strength and ability. And I know that a lot of times we, we may never see the link between getting into the presence of God and our breakthrough or our success. We, we, we can't see it or we can't work out the connection or the link between, but I tell you, it's there. And God is making sure in this moment that Joshua is set up for success because he gets into the presence of God. So church, let this be a brand new year. Worship team, you guys are out there listening. I tell you, lead us into the presence of God. Lead us in worship. Don't just play music. Don't just sing songs. Lead us into the holiest place of all. You prayers, you intercessors out there. This year, I tell you, call down heaven on this place. Let the anointing loose over this church. Pray for Holy Ghost fire, for the anointing of God to break yokes and change lives. Pray that every service will be an encounter in the habitation of the presence of God in the mighty name of Jesus. For the few who, who have the opportunity, the privilege to preach up here, don't you dare get up here and just preach something that's you know, regurgitated or something that's yesterday's bread. You get up here with the anointing and the fire of God and you let God be God in Jesus' name. Break the boundaries, shake the walls, cause them to fall and church, all of you, every one of us, let's make sure that every service that we come into in this year, even the digital ones that we might be holding because the pandemic situation come with a hungry heart. I am passionate, God, to know you. I want to get into your presence. I want to seek your face because I know there's a beauty when I hang out there. It's, it's beautiful. I don't know. I can't explain this, but I know it by experience. You know what the scriptures say? Psalm, 50, Psalm 97 verse 5 says, The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The whole world is subject to the presence of God. You get yourself in the presence of God, you watch your problems melt like wax. You watch the way that the, the strongholds and bondages melt, the way that the issues and struggles and personal bits and pieces and physical bodies get healed in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. you got to do it, church. If you've never been in the presence of God, whoo, come on. Hang out for it, long for it, desire it, because God's not far away. He's living in our midst. And I thank God this is a church where His presence is always welcome. Hallelujah. Here's key number three. Attune your eyes and ears towards God's plan. We've got to learn, church, how to be sensitive, to understand and hear what God is saying, where He's leading us. Joshua arrived at Jericho. These are the first words that are recorded. Joshua 6 verse 1. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut. Tightly shut. I love the next verse. Verse 2. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. We need to know that God is not intimidated by strongly shut doors and neither should we be. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on, church. This is good news, right? What, what is it in your life today that seems like it's tightly shut? Your visa situation tightly shut? The marriage, it's hopelessly disintegrating, seems tightly shut? Your job, it's like it's just, you know, falling away, tightly shut? Your health is deteriorating, tightly shut? Does God have a way? Absolutely. Is God stumped? No way. Do, is, have you hit a roadblock where there is no answer or no solution? absolutely not you need to know the doors might seem to be closed the walls might seem too high your problems might seem too strong but if the lord says the city is yours then it's yours for the taking glory hallelujah you know there's a lot of ways we could describe this situation of jericho we could we could say wow this is beautiful scenery way better than the wilderness we've been hanging out in for all that time oh jericho is too big we could never miss it our, our missiles our cannons they could never miss that city but you know the way the, the author describes jericho here he describes it and he says the doors were tightly shut isn't it funny how 
human nature and mentality emphasizes the impossibilities, we focus out of everything else. We focus on the tightly shut door. We are experts at taking the impossible and making the impossible seem even more impossible. <laughs> Am I preaching to the right crowd today? I need to remind you something. Pay attention. Write it down. God didn't use the door to win the victory over Jericho. He simply caused the whole city to crumble. Humans care about the door because it's the only way we can see to enter the city. But God sees a whole lot bigger than what we see. We need to understand humans will never see all the ways God sees, but God can do it. God can do it. And that's what trust is all about. God will make a way where there is no way. So stop, please stop giving air time, giving energy, giving heart to all the things that we think are impossible. We don't think it can happen. It's, it'll never happen like that. I can't see a way. Um, God is planning on doing it a whole different way than what you imagined it, than what you could see or envision. Uh, there is nothing, nothing impossible to our God. Hallelujah. My God, I tell you, I've seen some good things in the past, but I thank God I haven't seen everything in the past. There are new things God's going to do in the seasons ahead. God is opening up new doors, even when it seems impossible, even when it seems that it cannot happen. Our God can. Somebody's got to say that out loud. Our God can. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. We got to start killing off small thinking. Small thinking that says, because I haven't seen it, uh, it, it it's probably not going to happen. This is what God said in Isaiah 43, 19. For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? Oh my God, that's awesome. He's about to do something new. You know what that means? It means you've never seen it before. You've never heard it before. In fact, you probably never even thought it before. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, As it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared. I love that word, prepared for those who love Him. What does that mean? God's prepared it. He's making a way. He has been doing all the work behind the scenes, getting it all ready. You haven't seen it. I haven't seen it or heard it. It's, it's been happening in God's heavenly realm and according to God's heavenly plan. He's been preparing and working out these things. And church, we're about to see the glorious goodness of God. So start attuning yourself to see and hear things according to the kingdom way, the way God has prepared it and planned it. He's got the good stuff worked out. He's got it under control. He's got the surprise under the covers, ready to explode like fireworks. It's coming out, church. 2021 is going to be the year. The goodness of God is going to flow over our lives according to our trust, our faith, our stretching forward, and God's promise, which leads us into the provision. If God said it, stop sweating it out. Stop stressing over it. There's no point. God's working it out. And you don't have to go through the door to win the city. I love it. Psalm 91.8. He says, Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you've made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place, you are going to see it with your eyes, church. Only with your eyes will you see it. Yep, God will make the way. God will perform the works. God will stretch and, and open up the, 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 the incredible plans and purposes that He's already made, uh, made, made very relevant, very real through His promises. So here's the deal. Tune out. Tune out to the things that disturb and destroy your faith. And tune in to the things that will cause you to rise up and believe and, and just come with expectation and anticipation for what God is going to do through this season. Don't let the faith robbing thoughts steal or rob you from reaching the people, overcoming your battles, winning your victories, or taking the ground that God wants you to take. Amen and amen and amen. And here's the last one tonight. Are you enjoying this? Here's the last one. Number four, we need to walk and keep walking. Don't stop until the shout. Don't stop until the shout. We, we know this story, the full story, with hindsight wisdom. It's really easy when you kind of read it back and read it in a few verses. But if you put yourself in the people's shoes, you've got to understand something's going on here 
that's really critical for us to understand even in the 21st century. For six days, they marched around the city walls one time each day. They got up at dawn and did it. And then on the seventh day, they marched around the city walls seven times. And at the end of that seven times, the priests blasted out of their ram's horns a great noise and the people shouted. And in that shout, the walls fell down and they experienced victory. But I want you to read very, very closely and carefully what Joshua said to the people. Joshua 6, verse 7, and then I'll continue to the second part in verse 10. Then he gave orders to the people, march around the town. Do not shout, do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. Did you see what I can see here? Joshua did not tell them how many times they would walk around the city. He did not tell them how many days they would be walking around the city. He didn't tell them what signs or cues they ought to be looking for as they walked around the city. He didn't say why they had to be quiet or what would happen when they made the shout. He pretty much told them nothing. He said, guys, this is what you got to do. Just follow it. Remember at the beginning of this message, I told you, believe and obey. Believe and obey. Just believe and obey. If God says it, it's our cue to get out there and just do what God called us to do. The simple command is just like what God speaks to us. I mean, doesn't this sound like God, right? Child, keep walking. You're like, well, I've been walking for a while, God. Keep walking. Oh, God, are you serious, God? Like, oh, come on. When's the miracle going to happen? When's the break? Just keep walking. I mean, this is our God, right? He just leads us step by step. And He knows. He's planned it. He's purposed it. He's prepared it. He knows when that wall's coming crashing down. He's only called us to just keep walking. You don't need to fuss about when, how, why, who. Uh, don't worry about all that. The, the Lord's got the whole picture worked out. In Joshua 6, 11, it says, So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. On the second day, they again marched around the town, this is verse 14, once, and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. Is there anyone in this room, digital room, that's starting to get a little bit tired of this pandemic COVID thing? It's like it's just going round and 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 round. It's, it, it's kind of like become very repetitious. Anyone? Am I the only one? Or is there someone else out there? I mean, we are believing for a miracle and a breakthrough in the name of Jesus Christ. And somebody said, Amen. Anyone ever feel a little bit tired of kind of just never seeing the breakthrough? And I, I keep praying and I keep turning up to church and I keep going to work and I keep doing all the things I'm doing. I keep giving all my effort, but it's kind of like I'm just going round and round and round and never quite getting there. It's it just, I'm getting tired. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone kind of giving up hope or feeling discouraged or despair because the things you've been praying for, you haven't seen them come to pass yet. Anyone? Anyone? Come on. Well, I'll tell you what, have a listen to this. In verse 15, it says, On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. Does anyone think it's unfair that after you've walked and walked and walked and walked and walked and, and you haven't seen anything happen in front of you, that now God asks you to walk even further than before? Come on. Am I preaching to the right people today? It's like God says, you've been walking, but come on, child, walk a little further today. Give a little bit more than you've ever, ever done before. I mean, it's like those moments where God says, come on, just give again. You're like, but I've given a lot, God. And he says, come on, give even more. Double it, triple it, quadruple it. Give in Jesus' name. And it's like, you know, we don't understand what God's doing, but He's working something out. He said, God says, stretch your faith a little further, a little higher. You say, but ah, ah, my faith is going to crack. I've already stretched it to the limit. God says, come on, you can do it. You can make it happen. God says, pray a little more passionately, a little more fervently. You're like, oh, I, I'm out of breath, God. I've been praying all this whole year. I, 
Ah, God says, do it. Keep walking. Go for it. God says, love your spouse a little deeper. You're like, oh, oh man, are you serious? To love? I've tried. I've given all my best. God says, do it. Do you know why God says it? At, at that last hour, at that last minute, it, it seems to me that the hardest part is often at the end. Do you know that Jesus prayed and fasted and he went out to the wilderness and for 40 days he did. And what was the hardest moment? At the very end, the enemy came to tempt him. The hardest is always at the end. The Israelites walked one time around for six days on the seventh they walked seven times why because the hardest is at the end god's about to turn it all around to bring a victory if you feel you're in your hardest moment in the most difficult strenuous circumstance of your life in this season i tell you look up child get ready because the shout's about to happen the victory's about to take place you're about to possess your promised land this is your land so go take it Go, go take it according to the promise of God. I don't know why it is, but it seems to me that it, it's always in the 11th hour that God asks us to go a little bit further, to march a little longer, to go around the town one more time. It might seem unfair, but it's just one final test of endurance. It's a final test of faith. Have you, have you ever gotten intimidated because you keep looking up and you see the problem? I mean, to put this in perspective, the children of Israel have walked around Jericho for six days. They have seen the problem in the front of their eyes six days straight. On the seventh day, they are looking even more intently at the problem. I know some people, they don't like looking at the problem. So they do exactly the opposite. They kind of just look the other way, try and put the problem. They say, as they say in the old proverb, out of mind, out of sight. They don't think about the problem. They don't deal with the problem. They don't handle the problem. You can't overcome your problem like that either. There's no, there's no right way of just getting rid of the problem. We have to face it head on with faith in the Word of God by walking and continuing to move in the things of our Lord. But it's interesting how humans feel. The more we see our problem, generally the more we glorify our problem. The bigger it becomes in our mind, the more impossible it becomes. We, we feel like we can't overcome it. I mean, by the time that you've gone around the city walls 13 times and been watching those city walls 13 times, is this problem ever going to go away? You've gone around your problem 13 times, 130 times, 1,300 times, maybe 13,000 times it's filled your mind and nothing's happened, nothing's broken through. The problem kind of becomes that stuck uh, am I ever going to overcome? What's the point of this? Uh, why should I walk around it one more time? Why should I pray a little harder? Church, there is a reason why. It's because there is going to come a time and it's not too far from now when you're going to walk around the corner and God's going to say, Shout! And when you hear that shout, Oh my God, shout to the top of your lungs. You shout with the victory shout. You shout with the glorious faith and trust that God will come through for you. And you watch with your eyes. And you see as those walls fall down and God himself makes a way for you to enter into your promised land and take possession and victory over what's ahead. When you shout, the walls are going to come crumbling down. So in that moment where it feels like you want to give up, where you want to lay out the towel, call it quits, say I've had enough, no church keep walking keep walking keep moving forward moving ahead because the promised land is yours for the taking hallelujah this is going to be a big church big year church I, I i tell you i can feel it in my bones it's going to be a big year for you for the church for the kingdom of god there's a an incredible promise and a plan that god has over this season that we may we may never experience again in the history of our lives. I mean, God is doing a new thing right here in our midst. Let's make sure we don't miss it. Let's take possession of what's ahead of us. Let's walk by faith. Let's stretch ourselves. Let's go beyond where we've ever gone before. 
Let's expand and enlarge our territories. Let's increase in our faith and our, in our trust. Let's give our effort and our energy toward it. This is a miracle working year. This is a wall breaking year. This is a breakthrough way making kind of year. This is a challenging stretching year, but it's going to be a year we look forward, look back on and we go, oh my gosh, where God has taken me. It's too big, too great to be true, but I've, I've walked it and I've seen it and I've experienced the journey and it's joyful. It's amazing. It's a refreshing year, a refill year a refueling year it's a year of power and of glory god is intent on bringing the reality of his promises and his kingdom into our lives for his glory in the mighty name of jesus so here don't get comfortable don't get comfortable with the wilderness that you might be walking in right now god has a promised land ahead of you it's time to possess it that land on the other side of the jordan river is yours so go and get it in Jesus name. I'm going to leave you with one final comment here before I close. I want you to think about this thought. I want you to just let it dwell and let it kind of meditate there on your mind. Write it down in your notes. Think about it. Let this one fill you from the inside out. I heard it preached uh, not fairly recently. I wrote it down. I thought, oh, this is too good. This is too good. You ready? Write it down. What you believe about the end has everything to do with how you will behave in the middle. What do you believe about the end? The end of 2021, the end of this season of your life, the end of your life. What do you believe? Because what you believe determines how you behave in the middle. Have a think about it, church. That land is yours. Go and get it. Go and possess it. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you for the beautiful things that you're going to lead us into through this year 2021. Oh my gosh, we are so excited. We are so anticipating and expectant for the goodness and the grace and glory of our God to flow and overflow over all that we do. You are filling our cup up and it is overflowing. And I give you glory and praise for every child, every son, every daughter that picks up this word by faith at the beginning of 2021 and says, hey, I'm not looking back. I'm looking ahead. I'm looking forward forward to the greatness and the good things that God's doing and I'm going to play my part. I'm going to keep stepping in, attuning my ears, scouting out the land. I am taking this land by faith because my God has promised it in the mighty name of Jesus. And I declare that blessing over all your children according to your promises and your glory. And everybody said in Jesus name, amen and amen. Hallelujah.